This is Wayne Everly, the pastor of the Duns Corners Church. Welcome to worship for June 21st. This is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. This morning I'm reading from Exodus chapter 17. The people, after they left Egypt and passed through the Red Sea, they wandered in the wilderness. Chapter 17 says, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They came to a place called Rephidim, where there was no water. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses said, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? And the story resolves with Moses striking a rock and water coming from the rock. He called the place Masa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? quarreling and testing. The passage says the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. The phrase traveling from place to place, in another translation, it says they set out on their journey, and yet another translation says they traveled by stages. Pretty much all say the same thing. The people are moving from point A to point B, and point B is the promised land. That's their destination. Even though the translations say pretty much the same thing, something about that phrase, they traveled by stages, caught my attention. It made me wonder if this wasn't simply a physical journey from point A to B, but it might also be a spiritual journey as, as the people were moving along with God, a, a journey meant for them to grow in their faith. Sometime in my years of education, I encountered numerous studies that talked about growing by stages. Eric Erickson believed there were stages of development, stages marked by hope, will, purpose, competence, fidelity, love, care, and wisdom. Lawrence Kohlberg identified stages of moral development. Piaget had a theory of cognitive development. Abraham Maslow had a hierarchy of needs. State Freud saw stages of psychosexual development. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, well known for identifying five stages of grief. It's not unusual to look for stages as a way that, that we grow in our journey and, and in our journey of faith. I, I wonder if Israel had the opportunity in the desert to grow in their journey of faith. I sure hope so. You see, Exodus 17 marks the third stop on their wanderings in the wilderness. It's the third stage in their journey. The people are moving from place to place. They're making some physical distance, but their faith journey seems stuck in a terrible stage, marked by grumbling, complaining, and quarreling. Israel might have arrived on the third stop of their physical journey, but in terms of their stage of faith journey, it seems like they're stuck in stage two, as in the terrible twos. Here is what has happened so far. Stage one, Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. They went into the desert of Shur. Three days they traveled in the desert without finding water. They came to Marah. They couldn't drink the water because it was bitter. That's why the place is called Marah. Marah means bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink? Did you bring us out of Egypt so we could die of thirst in the desert? Stage one in their physical journey, Stage two in their spiritual journey, the terrible twos. Now stage two of their physical journey, they set out, came to the desert of sin. In the desert of sin, they grumbled against Moses and Aaron. They said, if all that we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we had food to eat. In the spiritual journey, they, they can look back and see the Red Sea where God was so faithful. Now they've seen the bitter water turn but in their spiritual journey, they're still in stage two, those terrible twos. Now we come to stage three. As, as we read this morning, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling by stages. They camped at Rephidim. There was no water for the people to drink, so they quarreled with Moses. They said, give us water to drink. 
Moses said, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water. They grumbled against Moses. They said, why did you bring us out of Egypt to let us die in the desert? Stage three of their journey, both their physical and their spiritual journey, it becomes a notorious stop, a notorious stage in their development. This quarreling, this testing, this grumbling, it left such a mark on the people that by the time they moved on from stage three of their physical journey, the notorious place carried a name with it that lived in infamy. Moses named the place Masa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and tested God. Masa means testing, Meribah means quarreling. Stage three of their physical journey is now completed. Stage three of their spiritual journey isn't there yet. They're still stuck in stage two, the terrible twos. They don't seem to be moving toward spiritual maturity. Numbers chapter 33, one of the later books that describes the journey, says that the stages of Israelites' journey it recounts the stages of their physical journey. Unfortunately, the, the journey is marked by things like rebellion and turning away from God. Eric Erickson, when he defined his stages, hope, will, purpose, etc., these were the stages of Israel's spiritual journey. Grumbling, complaining, quarreling, testing, worshiping a golden calf, craving, opposing, rebelling, and insolence. Their physical journey took them to the brink of the promised land. Their spiritual journey took them to the brink of disaster. Masa and Meribah, testing and quarreling. There's something redeeming about those words in that they're mentioned in another passage of scripture. It's a psalm, Psalm 95, the psalm that we used earlier in worship today. And by the time Masa and Meribah are mentioned in the psalm, it gives us the impression that maybe somewhere along the line, Israel started to grow in their spiritual journey. They, they started advancing from one stage to another. The prayer that is Psalm 95 is the prayer of a person who's not stuck but a person who's growing closer and closer to God, singing with joy to the Lord, shouting to the rock of salvation, coming before God with thanksgiving, extolling the Lord who is the great God and King. The psalmist says, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker. He is our God. We are the people of his pasture. That's, that's a wonderful testament that that Israel didn't remain stuck in the terrible twos, that, that certain ones grew in their faith. Now the way the psalm moves toward the end is an appeal to the people. Today, if you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your heart as you did at Massa and Meribah in the desert, where your fathers tested and quarreled with God. I called their stage of faith the terrible twos. The, the psalmist calls it a stage of faith of the hard heart. The blessings that God gives are met with testing and grumbling. The, the faithfulness of God is met with opposition and insolence. The love of God is met with a hard heart. But the psalm shows that as humans, as children of God, we can grow to a place where we do not have a hard heart but instead we grow close to God, a soft and a gentle heart that instead of testing God, trusts in God. I had a good friend named Charles who trusted the Lord. I don't know everything that happened in Charles' life that led him to trust the Lord, but, but boy, he did. Charles trusted the Lord. He was part of a men's group in Houston that met every Tuesday morning. Charles was there every week. And, and to move through the stages of faith to spiritual maturity, it's a tricky process. And, 
And Charles sort of looked down on himself. He had never graduated from college, and, and he sort of bore that as a badge that, that he wasn't proud of, maybe even embarrassed. And, and I would say, Charles, don't let that get you down. You have such a strong faith in God. And, and Charles would pretend like he didn't have knowledge. I said, Charles, I've never met anyone in the world that memorizes scripture better than you. He was a walking, talking, memorized scripture, a fountain of scripture. I never prayed the 23rd Psalm with Charles when I prayed it alone. I would start praying it, and by memory, Charles would pray it. And as much as Charles loved the 23rd Psalm, he would take hymns and make the most beautiful prayers of them. And 23rd Psalm was important to him, hymns, but his favorite passage of scripture was from the prophet Habakkuk, this little oracle of a prophet. In Habakkuk, there, there are words that, that talk about waiting upon the Lord. If the word of God tarries, wait for it. That's not the part Charles memorized. There's another part that says the righteous will live by faith. And, and Paul, he took that passage and, and that led to the epic writing of, of Romans. But, but that's not the part Charles focused on. Charles found the words at the end of Habakkuk, that this little oracle from a prophet with a strange name that says this, though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vine, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stall, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. His stages of faith took him to a place where he trusted God. Charles knew those words by heart. Our group would meet on Tuesdays and, and toward the end of our lesson without fail, Charles would say his verse. It, maybe a, a fellow member in the group was sick or it was an older group of men. Sometimes one of our own number had died and, and you could count on Charles to say, though the fig tree does not bud, we met on September 11, 2001, after the planes had hit the towers. During that dark time, Charles said, and there are no grapes on the vine. Soon after that war started in Afghanistan and Iraq, and Charles boldly proclaimed, oh, the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food. His adult son, Bill, got sick, was in the hospital, Nevertheless, Charles prayed, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stall, through it all, Charles trusted the Lord. He was teaching us to trust God. He was teaching me to trust God. And then his son, Bill, who was sick, did not get better. And then his son, Bill, who was sick, died. Next Tuesday, Charles showed up to our men's group, came to class. End of the class, I, I closed my eyes and I waited for Charles to say his prayer. He never prayed that day, he was quiet. The next week he came to class, he was quiet. The next week he came to class and he was quiet and and after enough weeks like that, I, I stopped waiting for Charles to pray. Grief is such a hard thing. It, it can pierce the heart of even the most faithful servant. Charles had stopped saying his prayer. But to his credit, he did not stop coming to the group. Time went by. Several months later, we were meeting. We had a good discussion. We got ready to close in prayer. I, I asked the men to bow their heads and, and before I could say the closing prayer, a voice spoke up, a voice that had been silent for a long time. It was a voice I needed to hear, a voice that, that had spoken to us when, when others in the group had been ill, the, the voice that spoke on September 11th, the, the voice that spoke when war started and young men and women went off. Uh, it was the voice of our friend Charles. 
And when he spoke, we knew that he had been on a journey with the Lord and, and they had walked together through the valley of the shadow of death. Finally, Charles was ready to speak again. I said, men, close your eyes and bow your heads. And before I could say a word, that voice of my friend Charles came through. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Today, I'm preaching the sermon I intended to preach to you on Sunday, March 15th, 2020, but the coronavirus halted us. At the very beginning of the coronavirus, with, with an opportunity to speak to you, I wanted to say these words to you. This coronavirus is upon us and we'll have to make our way through it, hopefully together as a church as a community, as a nation, as a world, and hopefully we'll remember we're in this together as we make our way through this stage of our journey of faith. Remember, this is a stage in our journey of faith. Because it's a stage, this has the potential for us to be Masa and Meribah. It is going to be real tempting for us as we go through this difficult journey to forget what God has done, to complain, to grumble, to quarrel, and to test God. Maybe we'll end up just like Israel did, Masa and Meribah. But on that day, three months ago, I wanted to tell you, I believe this journey in our stage of faith, it will not be like Masa and Meribah. From what I know about you, the people who make up this congregation, this community of faith, from what I know about you, I believe this will be a time when you choose to trust God. That's just who you are. That's just who we are together. I believe when the psalmist said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart like Moss and Meribah, I believed you would not harden your heart. I believed you would not test God. I believed you would trust God like my friend Charles real challenges, real struggles, real disappointments. But through it all, you would know that the Lord is your shepherd, guiding, providing, blessing, protecting. And I haven't been disappointed. That's who you've been. You haven't tested God, you've trusted God. I believed that about you on March 15, 2020. And I believe that on June 21st, 2020. And there's no reason to doubt that it'll be any different as we continue to journey through the stages of faith. Friends, we can choose to test God. We can live in that stage of faith that's known as Masa and Meribah, hearts hardened. God's desire is that we would move to a better stage in our journey of faith, to a to a more mature stage in our journey of faith. Today, our God, our loving and caring, our kind and compassionate God is moving us from that stage of testing to the stage where we're trusting. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord God, our maker. He is our God and we are the people of his pasture. We are his flock and he will always surround us with his love and with his care, amen.